All right, Paul. Thanks for being with us on another SBG podcast. It's always good to talk to you. Yeah, good to be here, man. Thank you. Yeah. So for I think most people know who you are, and especially if they're part of SBG. For people who don't, you started in 1999, 98 or 99, yeah? Yeah. And we're the third kind of out-of-town instructor ever in the organization that wasn't from Oregon. Yeah, yeah. Like 22, 23 long years. Yeah. Uh, and what I thought we'd talk about today is something you and I have talked about for a long time, almost three decades, which is but there's always new people coming into the martial arts, always new people joining the organization. So it's one of those things, you know, we're probably always going to have to talk about. And that's the idea that there's martial arts for street and martial arts for sport. And I'm going to divide it up into two categories. In one category, you'll have people who maybe come from what I would call a fantasy-based martial art, traditional martial art that doesn't work. And when they hear about combat sports being effective or functional, they'll immediately say, yeah, but that's for the street. And then UFC, they have rules. And in, in fights, going to be multiple opponents, weapons, and on and on. You hear that all the time. Mm-hmm. And there's another kind of version of that question that I think is newer um, and more legitimate that comes from some of the old school jiu-jitsu people, like, for example, Professor Fabio Santos, where they're, they've expressed concern that within the community of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you have a lot of the Vale Tudo, which was the jiu-jitsu that you and I started with in the early 90s, where we're always doing jiu-jitsu for fighting, is starting to disappear, and it's being replaced by um, jiu-jitsu that's pretty much uh, designed for IBJJF, for that point system. So those yeah. are two, two very different, I think, ways to approach questions, and different types of questions. So let's start with the first one. When you have people who will bring up that street versus sport fallacy after doing this for multiple decades, how do you answer that now? I, I answer it still the same way that we've always answered it, which is that the take a guy who has a high – level of skill or even a medium level of skill with, with boxing or Muay Thai, some sort of delivery system. Yeah, that's one, I think that was one of the kind of the, the genius things behind what we did was when you coined the term delivery system, it took away a lot of that argument because it's like, listen, if, if I have a guy who's decent level boxing or Muay Thai, either one of those two, on a regular basis, he's able to touch a moving, resisting opponent in the face with a gloved fist, how hard is it going to be for me to take that same person and say, listen, I just need you to open your hand and put your fingers in their eye. That guy's probably going to be able to do it a lot easier with a lot more efficiency and effectiveness than someone who never reaches that level of skill against a resisting opponent. It's one thing to do it against a dummy or somebody who's just kind of letting you do what you're doing, but to do it against a resisting opponent. So that was, I feel like those answers are still valid answers to that question where we're working against resistance. It's just a simple tweak of a few things to make it street ready, kind of. You're basically walking around with like a Shelby 350 or Cobra type car that you can drive on the street, but we tweak it a little and now it's a race car, Right. you know? And so I feel like those kind of arguments or points rather we're always a little like grasping at straws like it's not really a thing because the second I tell somebody or I think you had an encounter too with somebody where you they looked at you and said well what if I hit you in the nuts when you were in a knee ride position on them and you put your thumb on the ride and say well I'll just gouge your eyeball out Mm -hmm. yeah and it's kind of like it should be self-evident you know that if I'm in a better position or I'm better able to use my hands and move and hit you. My ability to eye jab you is probably going to be a lot better, a lot higher percentage than your ability if you don't have those skills. And so, yeah, I, I always kind of felt like to us it was obvious, mm-hmm. but to guys that weren't dealing with high-level athletes or training in an athletic environment, maybe that's why they weren't seeing it. Like it's really hard to hit somebody who's trying to hit you back. Right. You know, and so now you want, you want me to try to do some weird, uh, it's just. Yeah, I think people sometimes think or they're told um, 
that there's some kind of special escape from mount position for, let's say, for example, that street, you know, that's different from what we do in a competition or an MMA and trying to explain to people that controlling a body is controlling a body, whether it's in the parking lot or, or the gym, is hard to get across if they haven't done it. I think once people do a little jujitsu, they can kind of immunize themselves from that. I think also some of the people always ask me, I'm sure you've been asked this a lot too. They'll say, well, those things don't work. Why have they been around so long? And, and I'll explain to people that because something's been around a long time doesn't mean it's good for you. It just means it's efficient at replication. And part of yeah. why I think some of those systems are efficient at replication is they've got built-in defense mechanisms, one of which is what we do is too deadly because it's for the yeah. – which <laughs> it's, um, insulates them from it ever being tested, you know? Yeah, yeah, they, and they all kind of have the same mythology, which we've all heard. And it's kind of funny to, at this point – in life have heard this same story, but in a variety of different martial arts, which is usually some form of instructor or master so-and-so is so badass that one time he was jumped by these guys, usually a number of athletic football player type dudes, jumped him in a parking lot and or in the street, and he beat them up so bad that one of them was hiding under a car and refused to come out until the police got there. And then only if the police promised that they would keep him safe from master or instructor so-and-so. And I've heard that from so many different people in different states attached to different arts. And it's just, it's kind of, it's funny from a, like a mythology standpoint, you yeah. know, like how those things get passed down and passed around and nobody ever says, wait, hold on. You know, like I've, I've seen football players run into each other. They couldn't just run into this guy and crash him into a car until he broke and stopped moving, right. you know. And so, but, you know, it's just to your point, they don't test it because it's too deadly. And that insulates them from ever having to prove whether it works or not right. in a controlled environment. Like, you know, we, we've proven that you can – make a wrist lock work you can train wrist locks in an alive manner sure. and you can use them and and make them work but there's a methodology to it right and and it's not too deadly it's not too dangerous just like you can train your eye jab so to speak in the form of a jab with a glove on if i can crack my opponent if i can aim for his eyebrow and hit him in the eye repeatedly probably going to be able to do that with my hand open you know, right. with no glove on. So there's really no reason to say you can't test these things. There's yeah. really no reason to say you can't train them. I've, I've been thrown really hard by judo guys, <laughs> and then so have you, but Greco and wrestlers. I've had some really hard, gnarly takedowns and been on the receiving end of them. I survived. Yeah. You know, there's just – I think we're overestimating or maybe underestimating the resiliency of the human body when we say we can't test these things, they're too dangerous. Like, no, you don't need to put your thumb in my eye to prove to me that it's going to hurt. But if you can get your hand, if you can't touch my face while we're in a clinch because I'm controlling your hands and I'm much better at it and I've got to a better position and now I'm about to throw you, do we need to talk about it anymore? Right. You know, right. You, you, it, does, it doesn't matter what the deadly technique is. Yeah. At that point, you've lost the fight. It's funny, they all do have that same creation myth. And then inevitably it turns into, in order to preserve the secret fighting system they had, he turned it into or she turned it into some kind of form that is passed down from one person to yeah. the other secret, secret form. It's always a dance. It's always and, it's, dance. and it's not even a cool dance. No. You know? Like, <laughs> a really boring dance. Yeah. So... So that's on one hand, and, and, you know, we've talked about that forever. You know, if you can't beat us with rules, why would you think you can beat us without rules? What makes you think yep. we don't have friends too? What makes you think we don't train weapons the same way we train hand-to-hand, -hand, alive, and so we can actually operate with those? On the other hand, like I mentioned, we've got a, another kind of a street versus sport argument that's, I think, more recent that's come from some of the old school jiu-jitsu guys who feel, Hickson included and sometimes in some ways, who feel that the art is being watered down and or, you know, turned into something like what happened to judo where it became an Olympic sport and then a lot of, a lot of things were removed for it that were designed for fighting. So 
Yeah. Um, what is your opinion of that kind of debate going on right now? Yeah, I see that and I get it. I get totally understand and can see that. And we see it on a regular basis with some of these guys who compete in MMA or they do the combat jiu-jitsu, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, and we see knockouts happen when guys go for legs or they get in a bad position. And you have to wonder, did they spend any time involving strikes in their training? I think that's a failure of the training more than the art yeah. or the athlete. Because if we, if we boil it down, um, jiu-jitsu fighting comes down to the four things that we have to do in order of operations. First, we have to control the hands. If I control the other person's hands, they can't punch me, they can't choke me, they can't throw me. If we're worried about the street, they can't access a tool, uh, pick something up. They're just, I'm controlling that and their ability to hurt me. Yeah. Then I gotta have to control the space. I think Hickson, the Gracies were really good at putting that point out there that the person who controls the space controls the fight, control the distance, control the fight. And I know there was a saying in boxing to um, control the distance, control the fight. So I have to control the hands, I have to control the space and the distance. That, that I have to. There's no other way around that. And then once I do those two things, then I need to start working on getting to a better position, a position of dominance, whether we're talking stand-up, boxing, kickboxing, or jiu-jitsu, judo, whatever the sport or art that I'm practicing, get to that point of dominance, and then I can end it. And how I end it is going to be based on what we're doing. If it's MMA, either strikes or submission, I mean, we all know a choke is 100%, you know, strikes, maybe, maybe not. Um, and if it's, you know, an, a dishonorable conflict where you know, it's street or something like that, I'm fighting for my life, then I'm either going to go for the weapons that are on me or something that I can pick up and use against them. Or I'm going to get out of there if, if I'm fortunate enough to just be by myself and I can run. Once I get to that position of dominance where they can't, you know, they're at a disadvantage, I can disengage and get the heck out of there. And I think where we get lost in, within jiu-jitsu, the discussion of old school jiu-jitsu versus new school sport, is we don't have – the new school guys are incredible athletes mm -hmm. and and – some of the jujitsu they're pulling off against each other in competition is amazing. Yeah. And I think where we get lost is when you see those same athletes compete in combat jujitsu or MMA and they get knocked out because they go for a leg attack or they go for something that leaves them open. That isn't so much a failure of jujitsu as a failure of training methodology because if they would have been training striking – mixing striking into their training all through their progression from white belt to wherever they are now at least once a week or maybe more just a, just tap kind of like we've always done it you know just a tap here and there to remind people yeah hey man like if we were fighting you'd be in trouble right now mm -hmm. you know and not the cheap you know i'm in trouble i'm about to get tapped out let me remind him i could punch him you know that's bs you know but just Every now and then have a round where like, hey, man, let's incorporate some strikes in here. Let's jits with hits. Let's just put on some – they have the padded MMA gloves now, so, you know, they're pretty big. And let's get in here and mix it up a little and refresh my memory on what it's like to roll with strikes involved. I think if they would do that throughout their white to black belt journey, we wouldn't see some of these guys getting knocked out the way we're seeing them get knocked out in combat jiu-jitsu and in MMA where a guy rolls up on a leg, like a single X on a leg, and the other guy just stands over him and punches him until he's knocked out. And that's, that's unfortunate because it's a, I don't see it as a failure of jiu-jitsu. I see it as a failure of coaching and training methodology. There's, there has to be, I believe there has to be striking involved throughout your progression of jiu-jitsu. At least you know, in the beginning, a lot, so that you become aware of it, but at least once a week as you progress upward, you know, you don't need to be, none of us should be getting hit in the head hard at all on a regular basis, but three, four times a week would probably be excessive if you're not competing, but 
to some degree, just raising that awareness that, hey, I could get hit here. And I think, and to the point, uh, like Professor Santos and those guys are making, and even Hickson, we've, I've had the experience of rolling with people recently in the last couple of years. It, and it's, it was the first time it happened, I just kind of looked at them, kind of caught me off guard. I went for their leg. We were rolling. I was caught in mount for a second. And I still remember, it's kind of funny thinking about it. I got caught in mount for a second and elbow to knee, kind of elevator him a little bit. Came over into a single X, so wrap my right leg around. Other other leg goes into butterfly, and I heel hook them. And as soon as I get on their leg, they look at me and they say, "That's illegal." And I was like, "Where? Like in this state? You know? Right. <laughs> you know, like, what are you talking about? We're do, we're we're doing jujitsu, right, right? You know. And as far as I know, you trying to choke me a second ago was illegal. You know. Yeah. So uh, that was my first encounter with that. And I remember talking to him saying, what are you talking about? What's against the rules? What rules? I, gym rules? I, right. I'm getting mean to break a, etiquette at a gym I'm visiting. And no, I be JJF. And that was kind of the, for me, the first time encountering that. And since that time, I've run into it a few times where people have made comments about you can't heel hook people while wearing a gi mm -hmm. or you can't do this and you can't do that. And to me, I feel like for at least for the straight place gym, speaking for the straight place gym, we're training to be dangerous anywhere and everywhere to anyone and everyone, regardless of the situation. And then just tell me the rules. Right. That's it. Just tell me the rules, what I have to compete under. But the rest of the time I'm training to learn how to submit anyone and everyone. And also most importantly, I'm learning how to not be submitted by anyone, anywhere with anything. I'm, I'm responsible 100% for every joint on my body from head to toe and keeping it safe from my opponent. And I don't ever wanna be in a position where I don't worry about where my legs are or I don't worry about, you know, oh, I lost track of my foot or he's got a hold of my foot, but I don't have to worry about it because the rules say he can't do anything to it. Right. I don't, I don't ever wanna, you know, I don't ever want to have that mentality. I always want to have the mentality of, again, back to controlling the space. Yeah. And I'm controlling everything that happens on this side of the, of, the, of the road. And so I want to make sure that I'm as safe as possible. I can protect myself at all times from anyone because that's kind of first principles of jiu-jitsu, right? Survive and escape. So I want to know, and I also want the people who are going after me to have the skill set to attack everything head to toe right. so that it keeps me on, on point, keeps me on my game. And then, you know, like we have Masters Worlds coming up in September. In the morning we're doing, you know, for comp team, we're paying attention to the scoring and the rules as they apply to each belt. That's it, though. Right. Like, you know, just in, those, in the preparation for that specific event, tell me what the rules are. Okay, cool. Let's prepare for that. But that's not my jujitsu. That's my jujitsu applied to this event. Yeah. You know, just like if I was shooting a pistol, how I apply my pistol skills to shooting a run and gun course where, you know, I'm running around barricades and ducking under stuff and shooting around stuff versus I'm at Camp Perry and we're going to be shooting bullseyes at 50 yards. It's still my pistol skill set. It's still trigger control, sight alignment, all that stuff, different games, different rules. And I should be proficient at both. Yeah. And always, whether we're talking about firearms or jujitsu, fundamentals transcend the environment, right? Yeah, absolutely. The fundamentals yeah. you can just play anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. The fundamentals of an elbow to knee escape is an elbow to knee escape. You know, that I might have to pay attention to while I'm doing that, he's going to punch me. So how do I deal with that issue? And that always comes back to base and posture. If I'm disrupting his base and posture, as I'm doing my escape, he's not going to be able to tee off on me, or at least not kill me if he does hit me. Versus, elbow knee escape in the gi, I have to watch out for the collar. Elbow knee escape, no gi, I have to watch out for the back take but it's always going to be the same principles. And it's always going to come back to those four things. 
which is controlling the hands, controlling the space, and getting to a better position. Once, if I'm checking those boxes, the submission's inevitable. Just what is the, what are the rules? Can I submit this guy with a heel hook? You know, oh, I can't. Okay, cool. But I have his leg. I can go straight ankle lock. All right, cool. Well, I'll do that instead. You know, and I, I think, but I do see the danger because when people take those rule sets and apply them to your training in the gym as if my training in the gym is under that rule set, so I'm not allowed to do this, that's dangerous. Right. I think that's, that's dangerous to the art, I think, and to the student. Right. Mm -hmm. People forget jujitsu was designed for fighting and fighting anybody. And yeah. once they get to blue and purple belt, a lot of times we're focused on fighting jujitsu versus jujitsu, fighting other jujitsu people. But it, yeah. you, you can forget what it's going to be like to have a wrestler, an MMA fighter, or just somebody in the street trying to punch you in the face. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the problem is that as we progress, so, you know, the way how to put it is we think about the street and then we train the sport. And I think that's the reason a lot of people get into jujitsu is because somebody road raged on them and they realize, man, I, don't, I wouldn't know what to do if I would have yep. had to get out of the car or whatever, whatever the case brought them in. So they're thinking about that side of it. But then over time, that kind of lessens, you know, that, that fear, or that motivation kind of falls away, yeah. you know, and we realize like, hey, I probably would avoid most of these issues by just avoiding stupid people doing stupid things in stupid places yep. and it would be okay. And so then we focus more on the sport and the sport's more fun and we can do cool stuff and there's always something to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, jujitsu sport, the sports side of jujitsu is kind of like F1 racing where even mid season innovations are happening and things are changing and evolving. And well, this guy's doing this. How do we kill that? You know, this, this is how we destroy it. And, and so it's, it becomes this fun, high-speed chess match that we all play, and then we forget, but it's still about fighting. It's yep. still a weapon-based art that started in feudal Japan and was then modified by the Brazilians, came to America, and was further influenced by us with wrestling and judo being mixed back in, things that were always there. And we kind of forget that, that this is based for, based upon a weapon based environment. And that here I am for some reason, weaponless, or maybe I have a weapon, but I'm going to use the principles of jujitsu to tie my opponent up so that they can't hurt me while I finish them. Yeah. And, and I, I think we forget that sometimes. I know I I'm guilty of that. I get so caught up in trying to figure out what's this new thing and, you know, how do I fin how do I use it? How do I implement it? How do I teach it? You know, for guys that are interested in it, that sometimes I'll look back and I'll realize that, man, it's been a couple of weeks since I've had anybody try to punch me in the face while I'm doing jujitsu. You know, like we need to go back and do and for at SPG Idaho, uh, I know like you guys, you guys have a just with hits class. SPG Idaho we have a um they call it a roll punch class. And it's taught by Jake Martinez, one of the black belts here. And it's basically ballet tudo. You know, jiu jitsu, ballet tudo style jiu jitsu. And it's really good. And That's so. I love. And it always works out to be the white belt jiu jitsu as well. That's the best stuff in ballet tudo. It is, right? Because as fancy as we want to get, as cool as we want to get with stuff, we we always end up. I'm going back to survive and escape. Yep. I'm in a bad spot, and it's a lot of situational ghosts, which is perfect. I mean, I'm under side control, cross sides. Um, he's potentially dropping elbows on me, but definitely bipping me in the head to let me know that I'm not controlling a hand. Yep. And then how do I do the fundamental power shrimp out, get my knee in there, get some space, and then start to either hit back or go back to what Kavanaugh talked about, the eight guard, which is submit, sweep, or stand up. Like, yep. make something happen. Yep. And, yeah, and it's cool to 
it's frustrating, but it's cool to be reminded of that every now and then. Always. Yeah, it's like, okay, cool. I got this really cool racing car that I drive around, but I also need to be able to go get the groceries. Absolutely, yeah. You know? <laughs> so That's a good lead-in here. I, took, I asked for questions from some people. We got a few. And I'll start with one because you just mentioned how jujitsu was a weapons was designed initially as a weapons based art from Japan. This is from Johan, who's from uh, South Africa, SBG South Africa, and his question was, "How does Brazilian jiu-jitsu go along together with concealed carry?" And the conflict in his mind, which I've, I understand, I've, I've heard people express this before, is. You wouldn't want to be wrestling around with somebody when you have a firearm on your person, so you'd be maybe less likely to engage. So, how does that combination work out well together, or does it? And that and uh, that was his question for you. Yeah, I think it works out perfectly well. It's a pretty seamless integration. Um, Masayub has a saying, which is, once you start carrying a pistol, you give up the right to flip people the bird in traffic. Because you you need to first and foremost avoid those conflicts, needless conflicts. Mm -hmm. However, if it comes to you and you don't have a choice, then you always have the ability to control space. We call it the in-fight weapon access, which is how or, or the timing issue, the in-fight weapon access timing issue, which is getting a hand free long enough to get to a tool. If I don't have the skill to control the space, control their hands and get to my tool belt, or whatever it is that I'm wearing, it doesn't matter. It, do, like, it doesn't matter. Also, my ability to control their hands and control the space eliminates the retention issue. Mm -hmm. You know, when I've taught, had the opportunity to teach police officers in the past, I've always told them, your retention holster, whether it's a two, double, triple retention, whatever the retention devices are on the holster, aren't as important as the 180 to 230 pound retention device connected to the holster, and that's you. You are the retention device. Control their hands, control the space, and you won't have to worry about it. And what happens is that people forget that. For some reason, when a, when a weapon is involved, they think they have to greatly modify their jujitsu. And what we found through 20 plus years of the ShivWorks stuff mm -hmm. uh, is that, you take somebody who's good at jujitsu and you make a few modifications, a few things they just have to be conscious of, and they go right back to being a high level jujitsu player. Because inevitably, what happens is kind of like Johan's question is how do, I don't want to engage, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that because of the weapon. And they become fixated on the weapon rather than remembering that it's just a tool. It's just a delivery system for whatever it is you're trying to deliver. So I'm not going to really think about it from that perspective. I'm going to do my jujitsu. I'm going to check those four boxes that we talked about. I'm going to control their hands. And I'm going to control the space. And that's going to take care of that problem. As long as I'm doing that. And then also, you know, get a training weapon, a training drone, mm -hmm. a blue gun or a cert pistol and roll with that thing, put it on and roll with it. And you'll see, it's not that hard. If you execute good jujitsu, you'll be fine. If you control their hands and control the space, you'll be fine. It's when you don't control the hands, you lose track of a hand. If I lose track, if you and I roll and I lose track of one of your hands, it shouldn't surprise me that it ends up in my collar. Right. You know, like I lost track of a hand. That's going to hurt me. If right. I lose track of your hand and you come up with my pistol, that shouldn't surprise me either because I didn't execute one of the rules, which is control your hands, regardless of whatever else happens. Right. And if we, if we look at it from something as simple as a guard pass, if, if I'm sitting up or if you're sitting up, I'm trying to pass your guard. If every time I try to, to reach towards you, you grab my hand and stop me. You could, hypothetically, you could just do that for five minutes and I could never pass your guard. Right. It's when I lose track of a hand and I let you get a grip that problems start to fall apart. Things start to, to disintegrate. It's the same with a weapon. If I have a weapon on me, I can't, like, I can't lose track of your hands. 
and I have to control the space, then we're okay. Which gets us back to jujitsu, which is why it's such a great fit. Yeah, exactly. So Coach Rich, that uh, is a good follow-up for our next question. Coach Rich Bopit from Niagara. Mm -hmm. How does your work as a former law enforcement, as a former police officer, inform your teaching civilian self-defense, or does it? So it, it does a lot. From the perspective of interviewing victims and seeing how those be kind of the predators operate. So seeing patterns, seeing how they would operate, seeing the things that they would do to, to, to pick their prey, to find people who were suitable to yeah. for whatever it is they were going to do to them. And then from the perspective of dealing with those guys, the, the emphasis, again, coming back to jiu-jitsu, when it does go physical, controlling the hands and controlling the space, executing good jiu-jitsu, well, it just – every time someone got knocked out, whether it's a sucker punch – or somebody got pushed into something and taken advantage of, uh, regardless of the area, whether it's a bathroom stall, a car, a wall outside of a business, you know, where the, you know, they might push you into the wall and then, you know, their buddy runs your pockets and the, you know, strong arm robbery type thing. Always, always, always distance and hands. You know, they just did. And, just not having a, a understanding of how the body works to do a simple escape. Mm -hmm. Whether you're up against the wall, we all have done wall work. We've all figured out how to use our jiu-jitsu against the wall for valet tudo MMA purposes. Just simple things like that, you know, has informed how I teach jiu-jitsu. We actually have a class in our foundations where we talk about standing chokes, mm -hmm. where somebody grabs you by the neck, um, one hand or two hand, we go through the process of how to unravel that, and then we put them up against the wall. I mean, what happens if you're up against the wall? Somebody has you pinned against the wall. How do you get out of that? How do you use the principles of jiu-jitsu to survive and escape that situation? And so, and that all comes from seeing what I saw as a as a cop, you know, yeah. and seeing how people because sometimes the strong arm robbery was just as simple as that. A guy who's a little bit tipsy you know, not in complete control of himself. And some guy just grabs him by the neck, shoves him up against the wall and holds him there, you know, has a fake gun or, you know, or nothing even, just holds him there and runs his pockets and then walks off, you know. And so it's like, well, jiu-jitsu has an answer for that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, definitely that, that informed that side of it. So another question came in. This was from um... – I guess a question that some of the ladies that train in our gym here had asked her to ask you. And the question was, some of them have had traumatic experiences before, had other issues, experiences with violence in the past that jujitsu is helping them with. And their question was, you know, you've tried to create distance. You've tried to make space. You've been assertive. You've made a lot of noise, done all the things you're supposed to do, but the aggressor continues advancing at what point do you initiate physical contact? I, so I like to go first. Mm -hmm. In those situations, I think it's important to go first. You can't wait for them to initiate. So I would say that the second they, and we know our, uh, what's the term? I think it was in a fencing term, the fighting measure, yeah. the distance you need to make, make contact with the foil. We know that from jujitsu. You know, we start on our feet, all the SBGs, we start on our feet for the most part. I know my measure. And so the second that they're inside of that, you've got to make a move. Mm -hmm. You can't wait. They're going to get their hands on you, and it's going to get bad quick. So I want to make my move, get to their back, end it. Good. Um, this is from Ray. He had two questions. Well, he had three questions. Well, I'll go, we'll go quick. I thought his series is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is awesome. It uh, is. What is in your range bag? That was his first question. Um, so I have two of everything, two sets of ele electronic ear pro, two sets of glasses. Um, I have probably 30, 40 magazines in there, spare magazines for my pistol, 
if it's a pistol class, two or three of whatever type pistol I'm running for that course. So I'll have the main pistol I'm going to use and then a couple backups. And then I have cleaning gear, ammo, use a couple thousand rounds of ammo, cleaning gear, and then spare parts that break often. Or not often, but what I've seen breaks because everything breaks. It's a mechanical thing. So trigger return springs, trigger springs, all that stuff, recoil, you know, sprint, everything that can possibly break on a pistol, moving parts, I have that in the bag so that – because a lot of times when I'm, I'm out of town, when right. I'm shooting, so I'll have everything in there so that I can either fix the pistol that I'm running or – at least keep it running long enough to finish the day and then swap out to a, a backup for the next day. His next one was top three systematic checklist for range gym and jujitsu. Not a hundred percent sure what he means by that, but like maybe the top three things you're, you're focused on or checking. Yeah. So for the range, always medical. I always make sure we have a medical plan. That's kind of my first. And that's just from seeing it, seeing accidents and seeing things that happen over the years. I always make sure I have that check in place. And then I make sure we're all on the same page at the range. If I'm working with a group or if I'm going by myself, I, I don't like to shoot alone. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to have somebody, I like to go buddied up with somebody. Uh, again, just a safety measure. Um, so and this is what we're doing, you know, and this is our plan. And probably the, the third probably system that I have in place for, for my range day is uh, how do I wrap up the range day? So I'll, I'll do a, like a debrief at the end with whoever I shot with. Like, hey, how did, we, how did this work? How did that work? Kind of run everything down. So those are three things I always do or always make sure I do at the range. Um, then what was the other one? The gym? Jiu-Jitsu and the gym, yeah. Jiu-Jitsu. All right. So – with jiu-jitsu, I, I, I focus on micro fights for my, myself. So I'm always focused on some sort of micro fight. I want to put myself in a bad position so that anybody that I'm training with, regardless of skill level, has the potential to tap me out to catch me. I put myself in a bad position and I focus on one thing. So say I'm working bottom half guard, you know, I'm, my micro fight for today will be I don't want to let them have the far side arm cross face. So I don't want to let them cross face me. So I'm going to give up the underhook, let them have that advantage, let them get me flattened out, and then I'm going to put this arm out too, and then I want to try to get my left arm in and stop them from cross facing me and then work my way out from there, and then I'm going to reset. And I'm going to do that over and over again. Um, that's pretty much my – number one system that I use for that works when you when you gear your training that way it's amazing what you can accomplish in a short period of time yeah yeah you can get a lot done and you can have match type intensity as far as like speed and pace and everything yeah. but not get hurt right not, not have something weird happen especially if they're lower belts or not as experienced you know and then also if they're not as well conditioned, that doesn't play a role either because it's, it's quick. You know, we're, we're cycling out quick and bring a new person in. And then I try to have, for my jiu-jitsu, I try to have a long-term thought process. I'm, I'm always thinking about grip, stabilize, and transition, and submission. So I'm thinking, you know, first things first, first micro fight, control the grips, don't eat don't let them get the grips. What well, then? What grips do I need to make this happen? And then how do I stabilize this? Because they want to create chaos to some degree. They want to create uncertainty. I guess would be the word. I want to make the person on bottom. That's the whole purpose of attacking the base and posture. Is it creates uncertainty because nothing's right. You know, you're tipping around. You're falling around. So everything's uncertain, your brain starts to spin out, yeah. and then I can start launching attacks. And so I want to stabilize, figure out what grips I need, stabilize it. Now, how do I transition to a better space? How do I make something happen here where I can transition into a better space and then start looking at a submission? And so that's kind of the boxes I'm checking. So I set up the situation, the um, situational goal, we could, 
I think we call that situational sparring is what you termed it. Yeah. So I set up the situational sparring. Here's the four things I need to think about to work my way out of this. And then when it's over, I like to just kind of sit down and journal either in my phone, like in notes or just real quick, just as soon as I'm not sweating, you know, <laughs> write down, okay, here's the things that worked. Here's what didn't work. Here's where I made my mistakes and get input from the other guys. Like, Hey, what, what was I doing? Right. What was I doing wrong? And so those are three things I always do when I'm training jujitsu. I'm always trying to get those. That's kind of my system or yeah, like a systematic approach to jujitsu for my personal training is those three things. That's really interesting. And I think a lot of people are going to find that really helpful. Before we go, I want to mention that we're going to be releasing your MDoc series here coming up. So for anybody who's interested in speaking about street versus sport and how those things combine, um, what can somebody expect from that series from you? What so you we're going to talk, we talk about everything from harsh words to, we joke around about hand grenades, but handguns, you know, so it's a hand grenade run, you know, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but we, we talk about avoidance and deterrence and de-escalation, all the things you need to deal with somebody who's just verbally trying to escalate, trying to push you into a bad spot or make you do something foolish. And then we, we go all the way up to what about the gun, how to deal with lethal threats. So knife, gun, all of that stuff. And we deal with all of it. And what I like about the series that, are, that we're doing through the Straight Blast Gym is I feel like I get to dive a little deeper into stuff and also add on pieces, you know, as things evolve. And so there's, there's some stuff in there for athletes who are a little better trained. That's the other thing is for Straight Blast Gym student athletes, I feel like we're able to add pieces of the physical puzzle that we can't add when I teach like a weekend course to folks that don't train, right. you know, not that we're shortchanging those guys. We're giving them what they can handle. Yeah. But if I have a guy who can hit a long cover and throw elbows and then take you down, you know, hit an Asotogari and throw you on your bean versus a guy who is having a hard time just remembering how to cover, right. You know, that's the difference. So with the straight place gym, series and folks i'm able to expand a little and cross over into the stuff we discussed in the beginning like where is the line between street sport self-defense and sport and how do they come together like where's the intersection of all that stuff and i think it there's a lot more crossover than some people want to admit it really is I, I feel like you know the stuff that we're teaching people on an everyday basis with a little bit of tweaking they would be real dangerous not that they're not already, but there's always that question, that self-doubt, you know, and it's like, no, you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. Well, it was great talking to you, Paul. Um, and if people want to get a hold of you, where do, where do they reach out to you? So the easiest way to get a hold of me is just through Instagram. So it's uh, Paul Sharp SBG on Instagram. So that's, that's the easiest way to reach out to me. Um, and I answer, I get all, my, all the private messages, I answer them. I try to anyway, except for the ones asking me if I want to buy geese and <laughs> martial arts <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we had a, we had some more questions, but we'll do another podcast here sometime later in the year, and we can get all those answered. And I want to thank you for, uh, for talking with us. Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate it.